everybody. Welcome to the Believer's Voice of Victory. I'm Jeremy Pearsons. Uh, all this week, we've had David Barton on this broadcast, and he has shared the truths of our moral, religious, and constitutional foundation on which America was built. And when the truth is revealed, we have an opportunity to remove misunderstanding from our present and our future. Now today, he presents facts from historical accounts surrounding global slavery. And this is a timely discussion that needs to be heard. So let's join David Barton now as he begins today's message. What I think is significant here is what we're now learning in the last 10 years uh, regarding race and science. Uh, DNA results came out just a few years ago on an extensive test done by the Smithsonian, uh, done by National Geographic, done by groups that are big into science, and they did a lot of DNA testing. And this is what they came back with. They said all races share 99.99% of the same genetic materials, which means that a division of race is largely subjective. Now it's interesting, a division of race is largely subjective. Now what they pointed out was this is when they came out with the announcement that according to what we see on DNA, according to what we know in science, man could not have come from anything other than previous humans. Man did not come from other species, he came only from humans. They said therefore we think there's a common human ancestor somewhere back there, Adam and Eve. We think there's a common human ancestor somewhere back there and it can't be more than 100,000 years ago. Well, what happened to all this billions of years in evolution and in myriad species? And so now DNA, that's why it didn't get a whole lot of coverage. It got some coverage. But they came out and said race is largely subjective. And if you don't know, there's only four races in the world scientifically. Now, there are about 30,000 ethnicities. You have the Negro race, you have the Anglo race, you have the, uh, you have the Australian race and what to call the Mongoloid races, which would be the, the Native Americans. So only four, four races. Um, that are out there, but they're 30,000 some odd ethnicities. So a division of race is largely subjective. What they found in that study is that any two humans, take, take me, I'm a little guy, take LeBron James, he's a big black guy. LeBron James and I have more in common with our DNA than do any two identical twins from the same mother in nature. You take two identical twins to a giraffe mother, or to a hippopotamus mother, anything. You take any two identical twins, LeBron James and I have more in common with our DNA than two identical twins in nature. That's amazing stuff. And that's what blew the scientists away as well. So a division of race is largely subjective. We're focused on things that really don't matter in the eyes of God. That's why in Acts 17, 26, he said he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. Hey, that's what the scientists just affirmed. From one man came all the, the men who live on the face of the earth. Um, and it, of course, that one man was, was Adam. And how, how many generations are we downstream from Adam right now? In the history of the world, we're about 150 generations downstream. That's, that's what we are. I was speaking at a large black church not long ago, about 8,000 members. I'm the only white guy in the church. And I said, hey, if you didn't know it, I'm your cousin. You know, I may be your 150th cousin, but we all came from the same parents. And so if you get that perspective that we all came from the same parents, that we have a single human parent, then that's what the Bible told us in Acts 17, 26. He made from one man every nation of mankind live on the face of the earth. We're all related. Now, the other thing we're told in the scriptures, 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the inward appearance. So we look about color and we look about distinctions and we look about eye colors or hair formations or height or whatever it is, God doesn't. He looks only in the inside, which what that tells us is the biblical view of man is that there are only two races that exist. The, uh, not two races, two groups. The only two groups that exist are those that know God and those that don't know God. That's the only distinction God makes. He doesn't care a whit about what you look like on the outside. He cares what you look like on the inside. He's not looking at the outside. He's looking to see, do you know him? Do you obey him? Do you follow him? Do you take his word? Because everything else is superfluous. It largely is subjective. So this is a good lesson that comes out of that. Now, let me go forward from that to where we are right now and see if in the remaining time I've got, I can take you through eight important points you need to know. The modern view of racism that we have today is largely white on black. That's the way we teach it in school, is white oppression of black, et cetera. And that's where we get all the stuff on, on white privilege. 
So this is, and, and this is basically new stuff over the last 10 to 12 years. Uh, if, you, if you haven't had a long academic career, then you weren't being taught this 20 years ago, you are being taught this now. So when you look back at this, the relationship between blacks and whites today has much to do with the historical view of slavery. The way we present history today is what justifies the way we look at things. If you're only going to present Southern, Southern view of history, then you can say there was big white oppression of blacks. But that's, to do that, you even have to omit some Southern views of history. So I'm gonna take you through some of that other history. So there's some important things to know about slavery and I'm gonna cover eight important facts that you need to know. And before I do that, let's just start with a simple premise. Does everybody agree that racism is a sin? Yes. Everybody agree with that? Okay. What that means is it therefore applies to all humans. You don't have white sins or black sins or red sins or any other color sins. Sin is a human condition. So if racism is a sin, it's a human problem. You don't just have Texas sins or California's, and it's not it. Humans have sin. And so when you look at it from that standpoint that racism is a sin, it affects all humans. Great examples, what happened in Rwanda about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago now, however long it was, you had a million people killed when the Tutsis and the Hutus went after each other, it was racism. We don't like your race, but you're both black. Yeah, but you're tall and we're short and you're race. If everybody in the world was black, we would divide up over whether you have black with blue eyes or black with brown eyes or black with gray eyes. We would find a way to divide up. We'd find a way to divide up over the color of your hair, the, the shape of your face. That's a human problem. So you find that so many things that go on in Africa, it's racism, but it's black on black. Wait, wait a minute, we're told that it's white on black. No, it's a human problem because it's a sin problem. It's a heart problem. And because it is, it's easy to divide into groups when we shouldn't. So it affects all human beings. Now, let me take you through some of the first things. First out, we're not gonna say in any way, shape, fashion, or form that slavery was a good deal. It was inhumane and barbaric. American slavery, that's why we have pictures of stuff like this. Uh, we have a lot of artifacts at, at wall builders to show the inhumanity of slavery. Just bad ideas behind it. So it's barbaric, it's not a good deal. The treatment of other individuals, you would never do the, you would never be able to justify this before God. He said, and the way you treated someone else, the way you've treated me, remember Matthew 25, can't stand up with, with this kind of stuff at all. Uh, how many times do you have to be beat on your back to have scars that tall? I've got scars on me from working outside and ranching and everything else. I don't have any scars that are half inch tall. I have to be beat how many times to have scars like that? So first, let's just put it aside. Slavery, inhumane, barbaric, bad deal. No justification, not gonna defend slavery. Having said that, let's move to the next points. Second point is that America was not a world leader in the global slave trade. Now, that shocks a lot of people today. This is a map of the global slave trade. And if you look at the global slave trade, the African slave trade ran from 1501 to 1875. This is considered the official dates. And the official dates of the African slave trade, there were 12.7 million Africans taken out of Africa as slaves. They were enslaved and sent somewhere else. Now, that heat map shows who went where. And so if you look at, at where these slaves went, 12.7 million, and about 2 million died on the voyage across. About 10.5 million actually made it to destination. Uh, you find that 43% of all African slaves went to Portugal and Brazil. You find that 24% went to Great Britain. 15% went to Spain, 11% went to France, 5% went to the Dutch, 2.5% went to the United States, 1% went to Denmark. Now, as it turns out, the United States is one of the lesser nations for receiving slaves out of Africa. We had a professor tell one of the kids, uh, we do a lot of leadership training with young people, 18 to 25 in college, had a professor tell the kids, all 12 point million of those, set of those slaves went to America. No, not even close. You see, it's, it's not, how come nobody's talking about Portugal and Brazil with the slave trade, but everybody's talking about America with the slave trade? Well, let's talk about America. The 300,000 slaves that came here, not a good deal. But to say that America is the root of all evil with race, oh no, not, not by a long shot, because again, it's a human problem. And many nations had much worse. The more evangelical Christianity you had, the less of an issue you had with this. And that's, we'll look at that a little later as well. But notice, how that over here, and I don't, yeah, my laser won't show up on the screen, 
But notice how that the lines are coming from the inside of Africa, not from the, you've got coming off the coast of Africa. What's going on, on the inside of Africa? What's going on, on the inside of Africa? It was black tribes that would capture other black tribes and sell them to the Muslims or to the Spanish or to the Portuguese to ship out. So black tribes made money off of enslaving other black tribes. We just bought a group of seven swords recently. These are all slave trader swords from the inner African slave trade where the blacks were enslaving and killing other tribes and selling them to the Muslims to make money on it. So that's why you have all the line. How did, how did all the slaves get to the coast to be shipped somewhere? Somebody had to get them there. Yeah, they got there because black tribes were enslaving and killing other black tribes to make money. And that's what they did was sell them to Muslim slave traders who sent them all over the world. So that's, that, and, and by the way, those things are really old swords. And I'm telling you, they are still razor sharp. Uh, one of our guys picked one up and got cut on it just when he grabbed it because he had no idea it was still so sharp. So that's, um, that's what's going on the inside there. So all nations had slavery. It was a global condition. Now, did you know that the first nation in the world to ban the slave trade was America. We did it in 1807. Oh, wow. Think of that. 200 years ago is the first nation to ban it. See, we talk today like slavery has always been an abomination in the history of the world. It's not. America was the first to ban the slave trade in 1807. Thomas Jefferson signed a law on that. The British quickly thereafter. Next fact to know is that America was the fourth nation in the world to ban slavery. First nation was Great Britain, 1833. Then you had Denmark and I think then France. Um, we're the fourth. When did we ban slavery? 1865. Wow, it's only been 150 years that people have been banning slavery. We were one of the first to do it. See, America was one of the world, there were 124 nations back then. America was one of the world's leader in trying to end slavery. We were the first in the slave trade. We were the fourth to ban slavery. So that doesn't fit the narrative today that America is a source of all evil and racism. Uh, America was one of the world leaders in trying to change things. So that's why if you look at this map right here, these are the nations in the world today and where slavery is today. Did you know that right now, while we're gathered here, there are still 94 nations who are members of the UN who have not made slavery illegal. Still 94, na if you want to talk about slavery in the world, let's talk about the nations that still have it going right now. Because right now there are 40 million active slaves in the world today. I help run an organization that we rescue people out of slavery. And unlike other organizations, we do it with guys who will go in and snatch the slaves right out from under the slave owners. Two of our guys have been killed rescuing slaves. One of them has been shot 17 times and keeps going back to rescue slaves. Slavery is a huge issue today. And we're focused on America with all the, the good things we have in America. Sure, we got some bad things because humans are involved. But you compare America today to these other nations that are going 40 million today. As a matter of fact, there are more slaves today than there were in the entire history of the African slave trade. So we're focused on something that happened two, three, four hundred years ago instead of what's going on today. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you look at it logically. So that's a point to understand. And by the way, this is the current global map. The most action being taken against slavery today is the Netherlands and the United States of America. We're one of the top two nations in the world today in fighting slavery, fighting racism. You wouldn't know that the way you watch the news and see what's happening. And that's because so many Americans have never been told this, this perspective, even what's happening globally. Uh, the third point is Jamestown. Now, if you listen to the 1619 Project from the New York Times, they tell us that slavery got started in America in 1619 in Jamestown. Actually, actually that's not what happened. What happened was in 1619, um, you had an English ship that captured a Portuguese slave ship off the coast of Virginia. They brought the cargo to Virginia, which included 19 slaves. Those 19 slaves weren't slaves in Virginia. What happened, those 19 slaves were made indentured servants, which meant that they served for a period of time to, to pay off the, what would have cost to feed them, et cetera. They were all given freedom and they were all given land. All 19 of them became, that's called an indentured servant. Indentured servant means I'm willing to become my own collateral on a loan. I, you know, SpaceX is taking, is, they're gonna take private people to the moon. So I, I wanna go to the moon. Art's right, gonna cost a million dollars. I don't have a million dollars. But I think I, my, my 
labor is worth $50,000 a year. So SpaceX, I'll work for you for 20 years if you'll take me to the moon. You can have my $50,000 a year. I will be an indentured servant for you for 20 years. You'll get your million. It's just going to be spread out. That's what an indentured servant was. I want to go to the new world. Well, it's going to cost about $10,000 and you don't have that. Well, I'll work for you seven years. And if you'll, if you'll let me work for you seven years, then I get my freedom. I'm free. An indentured servant was not a slave. It was someone who put themselves up for collateral. So those 19 slaves became indentured servants. They were all given freedom and they were all given land by the state of Virginia. The first, one of the guys who had been an indentured servant is a guy named Anthony Johnson. Anthony Johnson was a black man. Uh, he had become very prosperous, successful. He owned 250 acres and he began sponsoring other indentured servants to come. And so they would come, they'd work for him for seven years, he'd give them freedom, they would get land, they would go out. One of the indentured servants he had was a black man and Anthony Johnson said, this guy is so lazy, he's so incompetent, he's so bad. Anthony Johnson went to court and asked the court, he said, instead of giving this guy his freedom in seven years, he's so terrible, he's so sloppy and lazy. I need to own him for the rest of his life in order to pay off what he, what I've invested in him. So can I own this guy for the rest of his life? And the Virginia court said, yeah, you can own him. So the first occasion of legal slavery in America was actually in 1651, and it was when a black man sued to own another black man. So slavery began in America when a black man asked the right to own another black man. It didn't start in 1619, it started much later than that. Actually, the first slave law in America, I think, was 1672, and that first slave law allowed you to own black slaves, white slaves, or Indian slaves. You could own any race, because slavery was, was, you know, at that point in time, it's not about race. So fourth is free blacks as slave owners. Now, this is an interesting thing. Free blacks as slave owners, there's a guy named Carter Woodson. Carter Woodson is the father of black history. We actually have uh, an original, this was a book cover, Carter Woodson, there are many books about him. He's a hero of black, black history. He's the guy who really focused on it. This was from a book cover. Uh, this is one of the many books he did on black history. And what Carter Woodson did was take the U.S. Census and he went back to look in the southern states at free blacks in the southern states. What Carter Woodson found was that, for example, in South Carolina, 43% of free blacks in South Carolina owned black slaves. 43%? That's pretty high. Now, it's not that there were tons of free blacks in these states, but they owned slaves. Same with 40% in Louisiana, 26% in Mississippi, 25% in Alabama, 20% in Georgia. See, it's a human problem. It's not just a race problem. It's a human problem. So black on black slavery was extremely prevalent in the South. And then if you move from black on black slavery, look at these pictures. See all the Native Americans? Who are they beside? Oh, those look like black folk. They are, they're all slaves. You see the 1860 U.S. Census reports that at the time, 1860 census, the top five Native American tribes in America had a higher percentage of black slaves than did whites or any other group in America. Highest percentage of black slaves were owned by Native Americans. And so Native Americans, and by the way, Native Americans, one out of every eight persons, that's 12%. 12% of Native American tribes were black slaves. They also, Native Americans also enslaved each other. And by the way, when we abolished slavery in 1865, it did not apply to the Indian tribes because they're considered foreign nations under the Constitution. Abolishment of slavery in Indian tribes came later than 1865. We had to go back and negotiate individual treaties with the tribes to end slavery in the, in the Native tribes. So Amer Native American slavery, they had the highest percentage of slave owners. And then you get into white slavery. Now, white slavery, we don't think much about, um, but these are all cards of slaves that were freed when the Union took the South, New Orleans in 1864. These are all slave cards, and you see black slaves and white slaves there. That's kind of what you see on the screen up here, is these, these little cards right here. And by the way, I uh, should have shown you this one earlier. This is a reward banner that was posted in Indian agencies looking for runaway slaves that got away from the Chickasaw Nation. So the Chickasaw Nation has bounties on getting their slaves back. You know, again, all, all races, all people had issues with slavery. So why slavery was very common at that point. Point number seven, if I take you to Muslim slave traders, Muslim slave traders were looking for slaves and often for them it was about religion rather than race. If you're not Muslim, you need to be enslaved. 
And so these guys specifically took 1.25 million slaves in the American founding era. 10,000 of those slaves were Americans that they took to slavery over in Europe or Africa or elsewhere. By the way, did you know that in the 16th century, there were more white slaves in the old world than there were black slaves in the new world? White slavery was a common thing. As I mentioned, that 18, 1672 law allowed you to own blacks or whites or Indians because it was just human. That's just, we had a bad view of things. Uh, point number eight, Southern whites, most did not own slaves. As a matter of fact, 80% of Southern whites did not own slaves. 20% did. You would think the way we talk about it today, 100% of all Southern whites owned slaves. That's not true. And overall in the nation, 92% of Americans did not own slaves. Slave owners were a definite mi minority in any segment of America. Now, there's no question that there were millions of slaves in the South. No question about it. But 80% of Southerners didn't own slaves, but we can look at the stories of the South and make it really bad, and it should be really bad. But again, that's not the picture of all of America. It's not the picture of what was going on with all of America. So that's the eighth point that I'd point to. So slavery is without a primary color. It affects all humans, all race. That's eight things you need to understand about slavery from an American standpoint. And if you understand that, it changes the narrative of what should be going on. So let me take you into some of what's going on. The 1619 Project, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, et cetera, are all focused on on, on, as we see right now, the protests, everything else, even the protests yesterday with folks killed yesterday. So the 1619 Project takes as a starting point that America was founded to protect and preserve slavery. That's a bad assumption from the start. America was founded by Puritans and by Pilgrims. The Pilgrims, for example, came here in 1620. The second load of slaves that came to America came to the Pilgrims, and the Pilgrims freed all the slaves and imprisoned all the slave owners, pointing to the Bible is the reason they did so. America was not founded to protect and protect protect and extend slavery. The Puritans, the Pilgrims all over New England, those colonies, Davenport with Rhode Island and Roger Williams with, with Rhode Island and what happened in Connecticut. I mean, just it's just easy to prove. So that's where they take their point, which is why you get statements like U.S. Senator Tim Kaine from Virginia recently said on the floor of the Senate, the United States didn't inherit slavery from anybody. We created it. How many ways can you spell stupid? <laughs> Do you guys remember something in the Bible uh, uh, about maybe Egyptian slavery of Hebrews? America w didn't exist 3,500 years ago. We didn't create slavery. We have it in the Bible. I mean, that's, we have ancient Greece. 30% of ancient Greece was slaves. 40% of ancient Rome was slaves. At the time Columbus landed in the New World, between 20 and 40 percent of Native Americans were enslaved by other Native American tribes. This is before America ever existed. The history of the world is slavery. And, and, and we created slavery? What a terrible narrative. But this is the kind of stuff that's going out today, and it's all, it's all bad on history. That's why yesterday, love of the truth is the biggest thing. You have to love truth, even if it's uncomfortable, you have to love truth. So slavery affects all races. Now the 1619 Project actually has curriculum. The curriculum of the 1619 Project takes as a starting point that America is founded to protect and preserve slavery, and that the American constitutional system is a source of our society's ills, foremost among them being racism. So what does that tell you? If you're opposed to racism, what you need to do is you need to get rid of America's constitutional system. See the logic here? This is the way they lay it out. So that's why you see, as I showed you on statues yesterday, it's not about racist statues because so many of those guys were civil rights leaders. So many of those statues that are being torn down are of union generals and of union leaders and of Abraham Lincoln. And there's no racism there. They were the, on the other side. Yeah, but it's tearing down the constitutional system. That's why we got to go to socialism instead of the free market. That's why we got to have Marxism instead of, of, of the, the constitutional. See, it's much, much bigger than what most of us recognize. We hope you enjoyed today's teaching from Kenneth Copeland Ministries. And remember, Jesus is Lord.